Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a global labor organization session on uh, religion, which will feature several chapters from the Springer Nature Handbook of Labor, Human Resources, and Population Economics. My name is Olga Popova. I'm a senior researcher at the Regents Institute for East and Southeast European Studies, which is in Regensburg in Germany. And I'm also the section editor of the uh, section Religion in the Handbook. Uh, today's presentation actually uh, are uh, included into different sections of the handbook, but nonetheless, they all talk about the religion and the relationship between religion and different aspects. And we will discuss uh, the topics related to political economy, institutions, entrepreneurship, happiness, risky habits, and overall social development and the virtual beliefs. Uh, each speaker would have uh, about 15 minutes to present uh, his or ch her chapter. After that, we will have uh, some time for, for a short discussion of, the, of each chapter. So you, in case you have a question to the speaker, please either type it in the chat and I will ask the question afterwards, or uh, you will have time to ask your question loudly after the, the, the presentation. Please do not ask questions during the presentation. And without further delay, I would like to uh, invite uh, the first speaker, Labib Shami, to present his chapter on the political economy of religion and labor. This is a joint work with Osnat Akira. Labib, please take your floor. I will... I was on mute. Thank you, Olga. I'll just share my slides. Can you see my slides? Yes, thank you. Yes, perfect. Well, <clears throat> um, the title of our chapter, as you see, is uh, The Political Economy of Religion and Labor. And um, the theme of the chapter is the influence of religion and religious parties on labor market participation. Um, well, studying the interaction um, between religion and labor is a relatively new subfield of economics, uh, all the more so studying the political influence of uh, religious parties on uh, labor supply in the economy, uh, which really um, has received very little attention in religion. So the current chapter combines these two fields by addressing the puzzling characteristics of uh, religion actors or religious actors, I'm sorry. Um, in the political system, um, as well as their ability to, to uh, affect the government policy making regarding labor market uh, participation and uh, the labor supply of their followers. So um, the influence uh, of uh, religion on the labor market uh, and uh, on the economy is evident in a number of ways, and uh, it can be positive or negative. So let me explain that. Um, on one hand, maintaining a religious lifestyle requires de dedicating time and also resources to a wide range of uh, religious uh, practices, um, such as uh, praying, uh, um, uh, attending religious texts, um, spending money on religious, uh, religious uh, rituals. Um, this time and these resources could have been directed to labor market activities that could contribute to economic growth and um, thus the negative influence. However, on the other side, um, religion may have a positive impact on labor supply and economic uh, performance also uh, by fostering traits um, such as uh, work ethics, uh, honesty, trust, charity. Um, when enhancing these traits um, could spur economic uh, outcomes uh, such as labor uh, market participation and investment and economic growth, um, if you would like, sorry. Okay, one of the main channels through which uh, religion influenced uh, the, the labor market is, uh, of course, politics. Uh, in the past decades, uh, religious uh, politicians have become a powerful force in many countries, including secular ones. Uh, and uh, in that context, Israel's Political economy is an excellent case study um, for exploring the influence of religion and uh, religious actors on the labor market. Um, this figure over here 
um, illustrates the number of Israeli parliament uh, seats. It's called the Knesset, as you see them. Uh, um, and these seats are of, uh, of the religious parties in Israel uh, since its establishment. Um, the relig religious uh, politicians uh, or uh, the religious political actors in the Israeli politi uh, politics uh, increased the share of seats, uh, especially as you can see in the yellow uh, line over here since uh, 1996. Um, and the ultra Orthodox parties have become um, significant political, political actors uh, and they seek to promote uh, more religious policy, policies uh, for their own, of course, for their voters, but also for the general public. Um, and uh, their involvement in politi politics determines uh, electoral outcomes and directly affect the. Um, the direction of the public uh, policy making in Israel. Um, well, uh, attitudes uh, toward uh, involvement in the labor market for both men and, and women vary uh, in the ultra religious community. Um, for example, there are the Haredim. Uh, among the Haredim, uh, which is uh, an ultra orthodox community, one of the ultra religious communities in Israel. Uh, men mostly um, favor full-time study over employment, uh, and they really rely on their wives to, to support them. Um, their share, as you can see over here, is 12% of the total population, and um, um, they are uh, expected to reach 60% by 2030. So um, if you look over here in this slide, in this, um, um, and graphs, uh, we can see the employment rate of the ultra-Orthodox men uh, in the left side over here down, which uh, barely reaches 50%, while for non-Orthodox men, the rate stands at 85%. However, in the right side, as, as you see, uh, among women, ultra-Orthodox women, the differences are not so great at all. And um, oh, now we go for the modeling. And um, if we want to model the interaction between politics, uh, religion, and labor, um, as you all know, a useful economic model is pro uh, in providing framework for uh, within which uh, to view the activities of religion sects and to explain religion-related phenomena. Uh, is the, of course, the club model. Um, this model is based um, on the understanding that religious communities act as clubs uh, that provide public goods to their members. Um, well, according to the model, religious organizations uh, efficiently mitigate free rider costs uh, and uh, efficiently mitigate also concerns about uh, defections. Uh, by imposing prohibitions that in, uh, screen out members with little commitment. Uh, these prohibitions are referred, as, uh, referred to as uh, stigmas and uh, sacrifices, and they play the role of tax on uh, non-group activities or uh, non, uh, that activities that don't uh, contribute to the club. Um, however, Scholars, for example, Shoy, um, argue that the club model is incomplete uh, since it uh, fails to explain the interaction between religious rules and the family life. Uh, for example, according to Shoy, um, the main purpose, purpose of uh, the Amish uh, rules is to encourage children to um, allocate their time according to their um, parents' prefer prefer preferences. Um, these rules um, reduce the productivity of other uses uh, of time, such as uh, wage uh, or uh, private uh, leisure, uh, and uh, effectively increases the level of uh, um, children uh, altruistic and cooperative behavior towards their parents. Uh, and since parents in the Amish community have political control, they use it, this control to uh, to impose these rules to benefit themselves at the expense 
of the children. And this is important since the club model cannot explain that. And uh, based on uh, COI's model, um, explanation can be provided for phenomena unique to, uh, to some unusual religious communities, such as the Amish, of course, and also the ultra, ultra uh, orthodox uh, in Israel. Um, so let me go to the model. I don't have enough time, I, uh, I think. So um, um, let us consider, uh, just, I'm gonna um, um, introduce a, a model which is based on uh, Shoy's uh, model. Um, and um, let's consider a religious uh, society that uh, consists of the number of families and a political leader. Each family consists of one parent and one male child who is endowed with one unit of time that can be allocated either for working in the secular sector, of course, or for religious studies. So the first activity, the working in the secular sector, yields only private uh, benefit to the child. So let us uh, let Y over here be the quantity of time spent on working. And the child can also uh, devote his time to religious studies, uh, which benefits both him and his parent. So X over here is the quantity of time spent on religious religi uh, on religious studies. Um, thus, each child faces this um, um, time uh, constraint, uh, as you can see. As for the utility, uh, this is the, the child's utility function. Um, let me explain in brief. Uh, um, M over here. Um, ranges between zero and one. It's indicator of whether the child is a member of the society, where M equals one means that the child is a member. Uh, the utility of each child is directly affected by his decision regarding uh, group membership. Um, first, we have, um, there's a benefit of, uh, for, um, from remaining a member of the religious society. Uh, it's labeled over here A, this A over here. And um, this benefit could represent a preference for a religious lifestyle, for example. Uh, and I assume that, it's that it uh, vary among uh, the children according to some in, uh, distribution, doesn't important. Uh, however, for some children, A can be negative, indicating that uh, they prefer to leave the group. Uh, second, we have the political uh, leader that may inflict uh, punishments on children who defect. Um, and um, it's uh, denoted over here by PC, this argument over here. Um, and um, we have also R, I'm sorry. Uh, R over here also ranges between zero and one which indicates the strictness of religious rules. Uh, over here, larger R or larger value, values of R indicate uh, uh, stricter, uh, stricter rules. And uh, these strict religious rules reduce the productivity of children's working time. For example, the rule may reduce children's wage uh, by restricting the secular occupations that they can choose uh, according to the group, according to the group uh, rules. Uh, this this uh, R demonstrates the influence of the political leader uh, of the religious community on the labor supply of their followers. Um, thus, I'm sorry, um, a child chooses to leave the community if this condition over here um, uh, stands. Uh, an increase in R over here reduces the left side without affecting the right side. Uh, thus, an increase in R increases the probability that a child will choose to leave the group. R, R uh, as I uh, mentioned before, are the uh, um, uh, rules. So, um, however, this tendency could be counteracted by a corresponding increase in the punishment. Uh, PC, uh, which would uh, reduce each child's um, tendency to defect and further strengthen, uh, further strengthen the demand of the political leader to increase the subsidies intended to, stu uh, to students 
I will talk about later if I have uh, time. Okay, as for the parents, uh, this is the utility of the parents. All I have, how many minutes I have? About three minutes. Oh, uh, okay. So this is the utility of uh, the, the parents and uh, um, and parents are altruistic uh, with regard to their children. And however, they also get utility uh, from the time that uh, children spend on religious studies. Uh, so um, I will go further. Uh, let's suppose that the political leader chooses PC before children make their decision if to stay in the group or leave. And suppose that R equals zero. And now consider the effect of a marginal increase in the strictness of religious rules in R. Uh, assuming that PC is sufficiently large that an increase in R does not induce the child to defect, uh, the effect of an increase in R on parents' utility would be, as you see over here. And uh, uh, this is expression um, uh, combines and a positive one over here and a negative one. I don't have really enough time to explain it. However, um, um, uh, if the second term over here is sufficiently small, then an increase in R may increase the parent's utility. This possibility could explain parents consist for setting strict religious rules by the political leader, even though parents are, are, are altruistic towards their children and uh, an increase in R, as I, as I showed before, reduces their children's welfare. So, for, to conclude, um, unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to explain more things over here. However, uh, to conclude, the lack of skills and relevant educations uh, are suitable, uh, education suitable to the secular labor market are obstacles facing the ultra-orthodox men when they decide to enter the labor market. However, these obstacles, we have to remember, were created with the encouragement of the political leaders of the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel and are the result of their strong political influence on the decision-making mechanism in Israel. And that was to, its, its aim to keep the young ultra-Orthodox men as students and not as workers. Uh, hence, the political power in the independent uh, is the independent variable that influence the knowledge and skills of young ultra orthodox in Israel, which is the mediator variable and altogether lead to the low labor supply of ultra orthodox men in Israel. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your very nice overview of the, presenting the theoretical concepts. I would like to invite questions now. I would have a question uh, regarding the uh, potential role of uh, labor unions in your setup. What if we have a labor union with or without political leaders? Uh, how would that affect the overall distribution of science into, uh, into labor and religious activity? Well, uh, in Israel, the union, uh, the the the. Uh, working unions are somewhat politi politicians, uh, um, if that's what you meant. So they have um, a lot of uh, weight uh, in the political uh, system in Israel. However, in the ultra-Orthodox, there is no unions or there, there is a rabbi. He decides, decides all. So, uh, and he is also... And you can see him as a political leader. He is not engaged in, politi in, politi in politics uh, directly. However, he has his uh, men uh, out there in the Knesset uh, that uh, they don't decide anything without his approval. Uh, so uh, you can see him as, a, as a, uh, the leader of the union over there, if you want. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? If 
not I would like to thank Labib for presenting his chapter. I'm now also posting the link where you could find more details about the chapter and download the chapter itself. And I would like to invite our second uh, presenter, um, Marjan um, Lajan, uh, who will present the work on the on religion and institutions, which is a joint work with uh, Irena Nikolova and Olga Panamarin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present uh, uh, the joint work with uh, Elena Nikolo and Olga Ponomarenko. Uh, uh, our work, uh, our text is titled uh, Religion and Institutions, and uh, uh, it was uh, published as one of the chapters in the Handbook of Labor, Human Resources, and Population uh, Economics. Excuse no. me, would it be possible to make it full screen? We somehow see the two screens right now, the front slide and the following slide. Uh -huh. Are you using two screens? How about now? Is it better? Yes, yes. Thank you. Very good. Um, so, um, why why this uh, uh, this topic of research? Uh, religiousness is uh, something which is globally prevalent, and institutions, both formal and informal, are omnipresent uh, today, and they were in the past. Uh, how do we see this chapter uh, fitting into the handbook of labor, human resources, and population economics? Religion and institutions affect the well-being and prosperity, and well-being and economic efficiency are essential for labor, human resources, and population economics. Um, how do we see the, the, the uh, objects of our research? Uh, religion uh, as a philosophy or system of beliefs, which is used by those that adhere to it to understand the world. Uh, or to support uh, them socially or psychologically. And today we have the majority of the world's population being religious. Um, institutions as by north, the rules of the game in the society that can be formal, uh, judicial, financial, legal institutions, contracts or informal institutions, culture, tradition, taboos, causal, causal contact, uh, conduct, attitudes, and preferences. Uh, what do we do here? Uh, we uh, uh, integrate and interpret the findings of the existing literature. And in doing so, we find that religion affects both formal and informal institution in which it joins geography, climate, migration, income, and another number of other factors. Uh, as a determinant of institutions. But we also find evidence that institutions affect religion, uh, both religion institutions and religion, uh, religious doctrines. Uh, no prediction can be made as to how religious the world would be in the future, although there are a number of theories that predict, predict that it may be more or less religious. And we uh, also find a multitude of methodological problems in the existing uh, uh, work that uh, uh, complicates the study of the mutual dependence of religion and institutions. Uh, furthermore, we demonstrate that future research is needed both, uh, both in development of novel theoretical frameworks uh, um, and in uh, studying uh, certain sub-questions within this big uh, field of research, and we give specific suggestions for how to proceed with research. Um, in terms of uh, related literature, uh, um, our work relates to origins of institutional features, uh, then uh, on the causal influence of religion on happiness, uh, attitudes towards market economy, work ethic, thrift, a number of other uh, um, 
opinions uh, and uh, the literature on the causal influence of culture on economic and political development, the causal influence of formal institutions on uh, prosperity, uh, and uh, overall uh, uh, the uh, 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 find religion as a resilient, time persistent and precise component of personal uh, identity. Uh, how do we think about this relationship? Uh, both relig religion and institutions interact with each other, uh, where religion affects institutions for which there is a lot of uh, 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 empirical evidence, although it can be improved uh, in terms of the methods used and, and the coverage of religions um, and geographical areas. But there is also an under-researched topic of the influence of institutions on religion. Uh, both of these independently are able to affect uh, the well-being uh, and as well as economic performance and efficiency, uh, which in turn affects uh, religion and institutions. Moreover, uh, we find that religion and institutions in an interaction, so together are able to affect economic performance and well-being. Why is that? Because the utility which the individuals derive from specific uh, economic and political outcomes, which is driven in part by institutions, which are driven in part by institutions, depends on their preferences, which are on the other hand determined by their system of values where the religion, uh, uh, where religion plays a role. Mm. In terms of the impact of uh, religion on informal institutions, uh, um, Weber links Protestant religion and attitudes uh, uh, towards the work with some evidence both against and in favor of this. Gianco and Nicola, Nicola demonstrate that uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, Eastern, Eastern Orthodox Christianity also affects a number of attitudes and beliefs. Uh, there is a literature that uh, relates Muslim religious upbringing to a number of uh, uh, attitudes uh, as well. Uh, um, in terms of the impact of religion on formal institutions, on the other hand, there is uh, work that suggests that Christianity promoted democracy, or in particular that Protestant missionaries uh, promoted democracy with some counter evidence. There is a, a rich literature uh, on uh, uh, the Muslim uh, influence uh, being in conflict with independence of the judiciary and non-discriminatory legal uh, uh, institutions. Uh, the underlying reason appearing to be the dogmatic prescription of certain judicial and economic institutions and a strong influence on, of religious authorities on the rulers that helps to uphold this. Uh, and there is some evidence that uh, Judaism plays a role in contributing to the economic sustainability of the kibbutz. Uh, in terms of the impact of institutions on religion, uh, mm, mm, the history of the Roman Catholic Church offers uh, a, a rich source of uh, information. So um, um, there are uh, uh, indications that the contemporary religious practices of the Roman Catholic Church uh, are considered an important reason for the emergence of Protestantism, which is evidence that religious institutions affected the religious dogma. Uh, if we speak about non-religious formal institutions affecting religious re religions, both institutions and dogma, uh, there is evidence that corrupt local state institutions boosted the spread of Protestantism when such practices were supported by the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, mm, on the other hand, uh, the reforms of the Second Ecumenical Council of the Vatican in 1962 could be seen as a response of the Roman Catholic Church to a declining religiosity and lack of state support in the post-World War I and II world, which is a suggestion that non-religious informal institutions, culture, can also affect religious institutions and religious dogma. Uh, so uh, one way, one set of causal effects of institutions and religion, just one of them, can be uh, represented by this diagram. Um, uh, where, when uh, institutions and the economic and political environment interact with each other, then religious individuals, um, on the one hand, have a set of their uh, 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 beliefs.
beliefs and a certain worldview based on that. And they also perceive reality, which results from this inter interaction between institutions and the economic political environment. And when there is some conflict between their religious beliefs and the world that they see, uh, they, there is a, a problem in continuing their adherence to their religion. When you have some people feeling such, such a friction, such as the elites of the European society during the Enlightenment, then they will change their ideology, but potentially the religious institutions and dogmatic interpretation will not be affected. If you have um, um, many people uh, seeing a disparity between their worldview um, um, determined by religion in part and the reality, uh, then uh, you may uh, have a challenge to, uh, uh, to the uh, um, um, contemporary uh, religious institutions and dogma in which uh, in the case of the Second Vatican Council, uh, the uh, Roman Catholic Church seems to have reacted by actually changing some of the institutions and even uh, the, uh, changing the interpretations of the dogma. There is more evidence on the impact of institutions of religion uh, in terms of uh, uh, the impact of printing technology on the spread of Protestantism, the history of the United States, uh, the influence of the Islamic religious and state institutions, uh, the influence of uh, 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 the uh, communist regimes uh, on the Orthodox Church, and also uh, evidence on the interaction between institutions and religion in Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, so this, this seems to be a plenty of evidence somewhat understudied. Uh, we see that uh, religion uh, and institutions interact with each other and that there is a persistence between, uh, between this effect. Uh, religion may uh, affect current institutions uh, directly because institutions may be devised in a way which is influenced by um, a religious party or by the religious individuals that populate such institutions, but they would also be affected if there was such an influence in the past because of the persistence of the institutions through time. Uh, uh, so the, both religion and institutions are persistent and therefore is also their, their interaction for which we find evidence uh, in the literature as well. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the uh, potential prospects for the future, uh, actually uh, uh, there, there is a, a secularization theory that suggests that uh, demand for religion would fall because uh, it could be substituted by scientific knowledge, rising educational levels, economic security, and institutional strength. Uh, on the other hand, religious markets theory suggests that the dependence of religious life from government uh, control would actually um, uh, create an environment in which the religions are thriving, and then there would be even more uh, religious individuals. We found by find counterexamples for both of these uh, theories, and therefore we cannot make a clear conclusion. In terms of the empirical challenges and the suggestions for future research, uh, the principal empirical challenge uh, is establishing the causal evidence through sound statistical inference. Uh, the reasons uh, for the difficulties to establish causality include omitted variable bias, uh, uh, where formal institutions are usually measured only at the country level or primarily at the country level and countries are different for many reasons and informal institutions can be measured in surveys but religion could be a proxy for unobserved individual fixed characteristics causing limited variable bias as well. Reverse causality is a problem because it's difficult to find instruments for religion uh, and uh, the existing attempts to establish causality included some study of some exogenous events, uh, changes in religious doctrine, exogenous to local conditions, event study analysis, such as the Roman Catholic clergy abuse scandals, but um, uh, also uh, instruments such as the lottery in Pakistan uh, to uh, give people a chance to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, visit uh, Mecca and Medina. Um, the distance from the center of formation, epi epidemiological approach, uh, instruments based on the family's origin, and also uh, uh, evidence, uh, it, um, another method, randomized religious priming as a temporary stimulus. Uh, these are, uh, this is what has been attempted. Uh, our suggestion would be to use more fine-grained data for on religious institutions at sub-national level, 
there is some uh, evidence, there is some use of this in uh, Kajé and Weda 2020 uh, about uh, uh, missions and hospitals in similar localities. There is data on the European Quality of Government Index that is uh, subnational. Um, some survey data from Africa also exists that uh, just is starting to be used. Uh, we also suggest that it would be important to develop case studies, analytic narratives, and conduct qualitative field work as complements to econometric analysis, uh, because only in this way we'll be, be able to correctly interpret uh, the uh, uh, to, um, to determine the precise uh, mechanisms. Uh, and uh, we suggest it would be important to expand the scope of research beyond Catholicism and Protestantism and uh, uh, geographical coverage beyond the Western world. There is some work on this by Janko and Nikolova on Orthodox Christianity, but uh, more studies on Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and uh, tribal religions would uh, uh, actually enrich this uh, field of research greatly. Uh, finally, uh, the impact of institutions on religion, which we believe, for which we believe there is uh, plenty of evidence, is uh, not uh, uh, studied uh, as much. And this is also one uh, way to um, um, continue this research. So um, that, that would be uh, all. Um, the slides are far more comprehensive than uh, the presentation itself. Uh, the intention was to actually uh, give the attendees uh, uh, a, a written summary of our hand of our chapter, and I've shared this uh, via uh, the chat. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm open to uh, any questions. Thank and you. so is Elena. I just noticed that Elena, my co-author, has just joined this. Thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, do we have questions? Uh, my own question would be, you mostly focus on the effects of institutions on religion. Is there evidence on the reverse uh, relationship on the effects of religion on institutions? We just seen the this interaction between political economy, labor, and religion. So what um, do we know about the effects of religion on institution? Um, actually, in terms of the effects of religion institution, there is a, a, a richer literature that uh, um, is studying that direction of causality, and um, um, literature that addresses both direct both um, um, causal effects of formal and informal institutions uh, on uh, religion. Uh, and uh, uh, I uh, can uh, just uh, direct the interested uh, 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 attendees to uh, the slides uh, 9, uh, uh, 10, uh, and 11 of our presentation. And uh, the most fa famous uh, uh, works would uh, uh, relate to the uh, um, work that links Protestant religion on attitudes towards work, uh, with some empirical evidence uh, against this, such as Yanakone and Cantoni, and also in favor, such, such as uh, Spenkuk and Chong et al. Uh, evidence that Muslim religious upbringing affects several uh, uh, attitudes uh, from Guizo et al. 2003, uh, Bergsen and Björnskov and Bergsen et al. Uh, and uh, also uh, uh, um, some papers by Berger 2004, Woodbury. Uh, uh, 2012 uh, uh, that suggests that Christianity and Protestantism promoted uh, um, democracy and um, Abramitsky's work that uh, suggests that Judaism uh, contributed to uh, economic sustainability of the kibbutzim settlements uh, and uh, a number of different works by Gutmann and Voigt, Kuran and Lustig, Kuran, uh, a number of works by the author uh, Kuran. Uh, that studies uh, uh, the influence of uh, uh, Islam on uh, uh, judicial uh, and also economic institutions. Thanks. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, we unfortunately don't have much time for more questions, but I invite everyone to look through the chapter and also contact the authors in case of any follow up questions. And now let's please go to the third Thank you very much. which is which would be given by Professor Andrew Henley on religion and entrepreneurship. And Mardian, would you please stop sharing your screen? Hello, can you see that? Is that okay? Yes. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation to um, to, to uh, talk about my chapter in the handbook in, in this session. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about entrepreneurship and religion, and actually I'm probably going to be picking up on quite a number of the themes that have already been explored by the previous presenter. So that fits really well. Um, I'm focusing very much on the entrepreneurship literature. I'm, my own position is Professor of Entrepreneurship and Economics, and I kind of sit between different disciplines. Um, and the entre entrepreneurship as a subject um, spans not just economics, but of course spans into psychology, sociology, uh, management, other literatures as well. So what do I mean perhaps by entrepreneurship? Perhaps the, 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 the literature that's perhaps most relevant here is the, is the literature on why do people choose to choose entrepreneurship as a career option rather than paid employment. And the in, in this vast literature, um, much uh, often the, the, the proxy variable that's used to capture entrepreneurship is um, self-employment, so working for yourself or, or, or own account. It's, and of course, there are problems with that, but nevertheless, so that's, that's the kind of context here. Um, now, the, the, the broader literature highlights um, a number of broader aspects beyond the sort of kind of individual characteristics and individual drivers, um, particularly social values, culture and institutions, uh, which we've already been talking about as potential enablers of, of entrepreneurship and therefore potentially drivers of that choice um, at a societal or an individual level. Um, and I would argue that religion has been and remains an important global phenomenon. Um, I talk in the chapter a bit about secularization, but actually I think that's very much a kind of Northern hemisphere perspective and the sociologists of religion will, will point to the fact that uh, there is not much evidence that secularization is an important phenomenon in the global South. So the, the, the question I suppose is why has religion perhaps not attracted as much attention as a potential enabler, even though within the entrepreneurship literature, culture, values and institutions are seen as important. And often, I mean, one major review in, a, in one of the leading entrepreneurship journals, I don't think uh, religion on, on culture, I don't think religion actually raised a mention, but that was a few years ago. So entrepreneurial activity can also, in this context, be viewed as, as one of a wider set of outcomes, uh, economic outcomes, which, which may be associated with religion. And to some extent, the literature does get a bit blurred. And in my, in my own contribution here, I, I stretch the, the definition a little bit. Now, here's just a, a very simple tabulation that, that sort of provides some prima facie evidence at, at, at the sort of national level to say, well, there may be something in this. There may be something, but it may not be very powerful. Um, if you correlate, this is a, a, a useful indicator of, of um, international variation in entrepreneurial activity is taken from the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Surveys. And if you correlate that with um, an indicator of religiosity, in this case, attendance at religious services, then uh, take the World Value Survey waves, recent ones, you see that there is a correlation, but the, um, the p-value is actually only 8%. Um, but most of the studies in this area tend not to be um, at this sort of level, although I have one myself from about five years ago, um, but actually they tend to be individual level studies and therefore they, very, they tend to focus very much on the specific context within one or perhaps a smaller number of countries depending on the data available. So I see the research agenda in, in, on, in entrepreneurship and religion as, as being one in which um, 
there's a need to establish convincing conceptual understandings of why religion might enable or it might even undermine entrepreneurship, where entrepreneurship is the outcome. And then from that to develop or to, to, to propose hypotheses which arise from that to empirical investigation. And those uh, that empirical investigation would seek to investigate or evidence that the direct impact of religion stroke religiosity and, and by religion, I mean affiliation and by religiosity, I mean the strength of that affiliation as manifested, for example, responses to particular questions about belief or, or simply frequency of participation in religious activity. Um, and the impact of that on expectations and preferences towards entrepreneurship uh, and those how those preferences then um, affect entrepreneurial decisions. But as we've seen in the previous presentation, there is a big problem of direction of causality. Economic outcomes and religion may well be endogenous to each other. Just to give you a simple example, suppose I am a, a an intending entrepreneur and I'm trying to find finance for my new business venture and I observe that the um, potential institution that will lend me finance has a particular religious perspective so then do I pretend or do I decide to adopt religious affiliation in order to make myself more attractive to that lender that's an example of where there might well be a problem with causality or endogeneity. But if we focus on the, 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 the causal process that runs from religiosity or religious affiliation through to entrepreneurship, then if we, if we read the literature, and the, by literature I mean going right back to Max Weber in 1905 or whenever it was, um, that then we can, we can identify perhaps a number of potential causal processes and they are each of these they're they're similar but they're sort of slightly different in different in nuance so there's the idea of vocational calling people are max weber's idea was that calvinist protestant christians were particularly called to set up businesses and as a result those um countries which saw in, in industrialization and development of capitalist industrial economies first were those that had the strongest Calvinist Protestant um, religious affiliation. And that, of course, is a hypothesis that has been tested and challenged for 115 years since. Um, and I, I've got some comments on whether it shows up in the, in the literature or entrepreneurship in a moment. Business success is indicative of divine approval. And, and one particular, perhaps extreme form of this is the idea of the prosperity gospel that you will see if you go and do work in Africa or particularly in contemporary North America, you'll see a lot of this that, uh, you know, I set up a business because God wants me to be economically successful. Thrift as a religious practice or virtue. So the idea that uh, the religious are more likely to save because that's seen as virtuous and therefore they have more capital to invest in businesses. Religion as supporting political or economic liberty. So um, entrepreneurship is an expression of economic liberty and therefore religion promotes that. And that's particularly associated with the rather somewhat left field or perhaps right field Catholic author, Michael Novak. Um, entrepreneurship is an expression of virtuous behavior. And I'm thinking perhaps more here towards the, for example, the, 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 the Buddhist um, idea of right living um that, that entrepreneurship then will be an indication of, of i'm living in the right way and then um combining all those two those together might result in some kind of um model which sort of says well actually religious attendance indicates some combination of all of those um and religiosity is is required as an indicator of uh, uh, to show that i'm serious about what i'm doing and then the last two on here are really more about the societal or, 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 or national level indicators. And I actually think these are the way forward for, the, for, the, for a future research agenda. The religion could be seen as an expression of a pro-entrepreneurship societal culture. And, that really, and, and particularly, I think that religion could be looked at as a source of social capital. It's a trust institutions which build trust and therefore de-risk uh, entrepreneurial venturing for uh, um, entrepreneurs from particular faith communities. Now, 
I talk quite a bit about the, the role of religions as institutions in the chapter and, I, and the perspective on institutions that I take is perhaps a bit broader than the traditional economics focus on institutions and I'm I write around um, Dick Scott's idea of three pillars of institutional force, the first of which, the regulative, might be seen as um, perhaps the traditional economics perspective here, that, it, that institutions um, constrain and permit certain forms of behaviour and in so doing they reduce transactions costs for economic agents. But I think the other pillars are also important in the entrepreneurship literature, the cognitive pillar that says, well, and religions create um, sets of knowledge, which people then take for granted, those established rules of behavior, ways of doing things, and those can be quite um, supportive of entrepreneurship. They may actually constrain entrepreneurship as well, but uh, they provide um, a, um, a set of knowledge, a set of information about how to behave, which entrepreneurs can then uh, adopt. And then there is the normative pillar, which talks about um, sort of social and organizational obligations. And this fits quite well in with um, the models of entrepreneurial intentions that you find in the entrepreneurship literature, particularly the more psychological literature, which I'll come on to in a moment. So each of those, I think, has some contribution. Now, focusing actually on evidence. So going back to my question about, well, what do you need to show? Well. The literature is really very, very fragmented. And there's a, there's a survey in 2020 by Block, Fish and Rayan, uh, who surveyed 270 papers across 163 journals. And I mean, the conclusion from that is that the, the literature is very fragmented. There's really somewhat rather limited exposure in leading field journals. Many, the vast majority of these studies are qualitative. They can be case study approach. And I think, um, despite the comments earlier about um, perhaps the value of case study work, I think that um, what, what one can draw from that is that really context is very important. And there are big problems, I think, in trying to generalize um, findings from one particular regional religious context into a perhaps a different context. So from that, I think one can extract, I've extracted in the paper, and I don't claim to be authoritative on this, but I've identified 16 extant studies, which are largely in, um, you know, they use microeconometric methods, micro data, they, um, most of them are in um, reasonable quality journals, established journals. I would say that what one conclude from that is that there's limited consensus on the relationship between religiosity and entrepreneurship. And that includes on the Weber hypothesis about Protestant Christianity. Um, I don't think there's anything particularly special about modern Protestant Christianity that ma makes it any different from other forms of religious expression necessarily in terms of its impact on entrepreneurship, which was, of course, Weber's particular hypothesis. Um, they may religiosity may well be driven by deep seated intergenerational transmission of values, which um, we've already talked about and we've seen in the two previous presentations. And I think because a lot of these, well, the, nearly all of these studies are actually um, cross sectional studies, they don't really um, include any kind of longitudinal data. There's only one that I think is a multi level study, which is in the next bullet point. I don't think they address the causality issue particularly well. Uh, and one study that's already been um, referenced in the previous presentation um, does suggest, I mean, it's not specifically on entrepreneurship as an outcome, but I think it's an interesting study to look at, the Becker and Voiceman study, because it shows that um, actually religion may be a spurious indicator. Of it. What's really going on is that, that, that those those areas of Germany which are, were closest to the source of the Protestant Reformation um, succeeded economically fast, better because they um, actually promoted education. The, the Reformation encouraged people to re read the Bible in their own language and in order to do so they needed to learn how to read and it was actually the process of human capital accumulation which may well be correlated with religion. Multi-level analyses may be useful in order to try and separate individual religiosity from 
what we might call regional or national institutional effects. So you do need cross-regional or cross-country studies. Uh, and there's an example of one um, fairly recent study which attempts to do that and is perhaps a little bit more convincing in its findings. Um, so I probably need to press on. Um, future research then. Um, I think the areas of future research to think about are religions as um, social networking, uh, I think this is perhaps under-researched in the literature. Networking is very important for entrepreneurs because it allows uh, the creation of strong and weak ties, and those strong ties may be um, trust-creating. Religions as institutions may well function in a very effective way at helping people to know who to trust and who they they shouldn't trust because if they work out solely with co-religionists as suppliers or as employees or as other networking providers of resource that entrepreneurs need then they they will they will be operating in a they may be operating in a higher trust environment if they are operating um they're venturing with their co-religionists and i think that needs um, particular emphasis in the research um Religions as regulative institutions, re reducing transactions costs, I've mentioned trust building, but also uh, monitoring and sanctioning behavior. It would be useful to know more about how religions actually um, perhaps monitor and sanction and, and, and then steer entrepreneurship in particular directions or perhaps sanction particular other forms of entrepreneurship uh, that you know, are not regarded as appropriate by the particular faith. Uh, religious institution and then state re regulation of religion which I think is an important issue to think about this connects to the economics of religion literature of Yanakoni and others the rational choice literature Yanakoni's point is that um, competition is good for religion because uh, it, it forces religious institutions to be more productive and efficient in the way that they deliver religious goods so um, societies which will regulate religion and therefore restrict competition effectively may well be actually inadvertently also hindering the growth of entrepreneurship. And um, I actually have some, ev some evidence in my own cross-national study published a few years ago, which suggests that religious pluralism, where there is more diversity of religion within a particular country, that may actually support more startup activity. So it's not the... It's not actually adhering or the, the level of religiosity or a level of religious affiliation or even the, the type of religious affiliation, whether it's Christianity in whatever particular form or Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism or whatever. It's actually about whether um, those religions are having to compete more effectively and productively in order to maintain their adherence and therefore are, become, are better at inculcating the values that are important to them and and that may be what's associated with stronger entrepreneurial entrepreneurial outcomes so this is um an extension if you like of a very popular model um within the entrepreneurial intentions literature the the theory of planned behavior and 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 this is a suggestion that actually religion could well be introduced into that model in a very effective way um, by looking at the issues around religiosity, the salience of religion within particular societies, uh, the, the pluralism aspect that I've already been talking about, so the structure of religion and the porosity of boundaries between different religions, and then seeing how those feed into the strength of institutions, and then how those institutions themselves then influence the two main drivers of uh, entrepreneurial intentions in this theory of planned behavior, the, de the perceived desirability, the social desirability of entrepreneurship and the perceived feasibility of entrepreneurship. And this is where my point about networking and social capital becomes very important. Other considerations, which I just touched on briefly at the towards the end of the chapter, uh, which are worth thinking about is that, first of all, the first issue here is that religions are a source of entrepreneurial opportunity. Religious markets are large. Um, a 2016 study concluded that in the, in the US, the religious economy, you know, religious TV stations, religious tourism, religious music, religious artifacts, all this sort of stuff is worth about 378, well, 378 billion US dollars a year. That's not insignificant. So religions themselves provide entrepreneurial opportunities for others. Uh, that's just as an aside. 
And the, the other aside to think about is that religious organization, this connects a bit back to my point about the importance of competition in religion, but religious organizations themselves work as entrepreneurs. And if you get inside, uh, for example, contemporary um, forms of religious Christian religious institutions, for example, in my own country, you'll see there's increasing interest in the idea that religious religious leaders themselves should view themselves as entrepreneurs. So religious organizations may well uh, promote entrepreneurial values amongst their own leaders. And there is one, at least one study in the US that shows that uh, religious uh, Christian appear to lead churches which have uh, more entrepreneurial outcomes in terms of uh, growth and levels of giving and things like that. Uh, and that is all I want to say. So I've finished. Many thanks. This is very That's inspiring contribution. Uh, we have some time for short questions. Oh, yeah. Uh, well. to unmute uh, thanks for the interesting talk now um, religious organizations uh, yes they can be entrepreneurial but are, can they be also innovative do we have evidence on this i my prejudice would be as a non-researcher in the field that uh, these organizations um, well, aim, aim at getting money but not necessarily being innovative what we, what we associate with entrepreneurial activities I'm not aware of any studies of that. Um, I mean, I could think of sort of case examples of innovative behavior. Uh, I think it probably does tie back to the competition argument. There's no incentive to be innovative if the state says you're the official religion and everybody has to go, you know, be part of you and any other religion is illegal. So what, what incentive is there to be innovative? Uh, where societies where there's greater religious pluralism, I could imagine that there is a need for innovation. But I think we've seen in the previous presentation a very interesting, you know, very important perspective on how actually institutions may... <laughs> institutional change may actually allow religions to challenge and adapt their conventional wisdom, or they may actually fossilize it. Now, within a pluralistic society, what you're likely to see is fragmentation. And I can see on that particular, with one particular issue, um, same-sex blessing, I think, was raised. In my own country, I can see that happening. Um, that that, in, this, that you see to innovation be starting to happen. Um, but uh, but but I could imagine that you know that there's a lot of resistance to that in amongst other groups. So you see both innovative and non-innovative behavior. But the Schumpeterian position would be if you have an if you have a monopoly. You can be more innovative. Oh right, well, that's a. Bit... <laughs> um, I'd have to think about that one. Um, I'm I'm not sure I, I I'm not sure I'd want to agree with that point of view. Anyway, yeah, uh, it's a fair comment. <laughs> So all about evidence. At the end, it's all about evidence. What we can find. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I could Absolutely. also invite the readers to go to the another chapter, which is on religion and inno innovations, actually, and maybe the, the answers could be also found there. Uh, we had one more questions, but we actually, uh, unfortunately, do not have time for more questions. If we uh, have time left at the end, I would invite overall discussion. But now we would need to proceed with the next presentation uh, which is actually by myself on uh, religion and happiness and i will very much um, i will very much go through the chapter how we pre we presented how we structure our arguments within the chapter uh, this is a uh, joint work with Vladimir Toshenko from uh, Yusuf Libek University. And in this chapter, we focus on uh, religion and happiness. Uh, this is the uh, overall outline and generally the outline that also uh, follows the structure of our chapter. And in general, uh, religion and happiness is a very complex the relationship uh, that uh, 
the complexity is derived basically from different aspects. First, it's uh, highly multidisciplinary. It's not only economics involved here, but also religious studies, sociology, uh, philosophy, and other uh, studies that is very uh, sort of multilateral relationship that could be studied here. And uh, from from this aspect, uh, it also um, makes it a little bit more difficult in modeling and quantifying. In this chapter, we are particularly focusing on the literature that is uh, published in economics, but uh, the studies of religion, of spiritu spirituality and well-being, of happiness, could actually be found in also different other uh, disciplines. And start our chapter from uh, talking about uh, the theoretical foundations. Why would actually this relationship between uh, religion and uh, happiness could exist and what could explain this? Uh, I may repeat some of the points that have already been mentioned by the previous speakers. And uh, generally, we may talk about several economic theories that could potentially explain this relationship. First theory that could be mentioned here is the allocation of time. So uh, individuals could derive utility from, from consumption during the, their life and also from consumption in their afterlife. And this brings them to allocating time into various religious activities and also investing time and uh, doing it during their lives because uh, naturally, more investment of time into religious activities in life uh, would uh, imply that the, the afterlife consumption could be higher. And here we can talk about three uh, components that could potentially explain the relationship between religion and happiness. One is uh, spirituality, so that uh, individuals would derive some uh, internal uh, pleasure or internal well-being from being religion, uh, religious, and that would uh, bring them more happiness or less satisfaction. Uh, the second point here is related to social networking and collectivity. Individual may uh, derive extra happiness also from uh, communication with other people or uh, other religious appearance who are in the same uh, religious group as him or herself. And finally, there are certain rules uh, within various religions that would structure the overall uh, well-being and bring, could bring some meaning in life, which, is, which could also bring more happiness. All of these aspects actually implying the positive relationship between religiosity and well-being. Uh, there are effects, there are literature also talking about the negative, potential negative effects of religiosity and well-being, but this is mostly not in economics, but more like psychological studies that would say, for example, if there is some certain adverse effect, uh, the, there could be some uh, negative effects uh, and the religious people could think that why, why uh, bad things are happening to good people and uh, sort of uh, have uh, be unhappy because of that. But overall, uh, there is a plenty of evidence that shows that this relationship is actually positive. And this is also very much grounded in economic theory. Uh, the second uh, theory that is uh, could, that could be mentioned here and has just been mentioned is the rational choice theory where we would divide the ma religious markets into religious consumers and religious producers who uh, where by religious consumers we would have the individuals who have their benefits uh, of participating in certain religion like getting social benefits or getting well-being uh, derived from the from being religious and also costs of participating in terms of uh, adhering to, to dif different norms or certain behavioral patterns. And basically the participation in religious activity and uh, having some benefit in terms of well-being depends on basically weighting this uh, benefit. And there are also religious producers who would be maximizing their behavior by the uh, number of religious adherents and providing the religious service. Uh, the other theory could be mentioned here is, is um, seeing religion as a club that uh, brings its own benefits to the to the members and also having the cost. This is partially related to the, to the previous point. And with the benefits, we have this uh, emotional engagement, social networking, 
metal or material, even material support in difficult times, and we also prospects of the afterlife. And with the cost, it is a certain uh, behavioral or uh, norms that uh, would be imposed on the members who would follow this religion. Uh, briefly, also, the, the, uh, in the literature, uh, we could talk about different terms, and one would be the religious affiliation, uh, where it would be basically the self-declared affiliation with a particular religious denomination. And in the literature, it is actually not always uh, empirically documented that the religious affiliation just by itself would bring some benefits to happiness or to well-being. Uh, while the second term, religiosity, which is measuring actually the extent to which individual is uh, religious, to what extent uh, he or she is religious, believes in God, attends religious services, this uh, basically uh, is documented to, to bring more happiness or well-being. And we could also talk about the religiousness, which would be the aggregated measure at country or subnational level related to the uh, to the overall sort of country uh, level religiosity or religion. Uh, in the chapter, we further talk about the mechanisms. And actually, it's quite difficult to talk about the mechanisms because there are not that many studies in economics that talk about uh, explaining why would religion uh, affect, uh, affect um, happiness. By the way, I'm here uh, using interchangeably subjective well-being, happiness, life satisfaction. In the chapter, we do not distinguish these, these terms. Uh, and in general, it is so basically shown that uh, religion or uh, religiosity would affect all these uh, terms in, in, a, in a similar way. But there are also literature that would uh, encourage, distinguish these terms. So related to mechanisms, uh, the literature on that is basically exists mostly in uh, psychology, where uh, the, uh, the the studies document that there are, there could be three main channels that would explain positive relationship between religiosity and happiness. One is the social support, so that uh, the the support that uh, individual receives from the religious community, and uh, this is basically serving as a mediator between religiosity and uh, being um, happy or being satisfied with life. Uh, the second would be the cognition or perceived control, given that the religion gives some meaning in life and sort of structured uh, rules to, to follow. That would give uh, the individual who follows the religious norms sort of more uh, meaning and more uh, understanding of the life that would bring more uh, happiness in terms. And finally, we could talk about uh, religion as a source of positive emotions and virtues. So the, in the literature, it is documented that religious people on average are more loving, more hoping, more, more altruistic. So all these emotions are, uh, or, and behaviors are also related to, the, to, to happiness and bring uh, happiness. Uh, Separately, we talk also about the so-called insurance effect of religiosity or religious coping. Uh, this is the phenomenon that is documented in the literature that uh, religious people are not only satisfied with their lives, but they also are uh, less affected by some adverse effects like, uh, say, unemployment, uh, individual unemployment or even aggregate unemployment rate. And uh, so the religion would serve as source of the stress buffer. Uh, in uh, in these adverse times, and uh, we we explain what this term means and how do so basically it is studied in the empirical work uh, where we have uh, the subjective well-being usually on one side, religiosity, some adverse activity or adverse event, and also the interaction term. So here the uh, beta three would be something that this uh, would be showing this insurance effects of religiosity that would work in case of the uh, in, in case of religious people. So they would be less affected by the adverse uh, events. Uh, further, we talk about the uh, individual level and country level evidence regarding the relationship between uh, religion and happiness. And here it could be documented that uh, 
on the individual level, uh, most of the studies, they find the positive relationship. So religiosity brings more happiness, brings more life satisfaction. And this is uh, documented in various contexts in different countries, in different regions. And uh, on the other hand, when we uh, transfer this relationship to the country level, so we, if we aggregate this relationship to the country level and talk about the whether the mean uh, religiousness in the country would affect uh, mean life satisfaction in the country, here actually we would not find uh, the the statistically significant relationship. Why it is happening? This is a separate question for discussion. And we could talk about different explanations here. One would be the secularization, where the overall uh, of uh, religion, uh, overall role of the religion over time is actually uh, diminishing. So this, with the economic development, the role of religion becomes less significant overall. Uh, another effect is related to insurance. So in principle, there is uh, many effects are coinciding here. Poor countries would tend to face more problems and are, they also on average more religious, while developed countries are, tend to be uh, facing less uh, sort of adverse effects, and, but also, also le less religious. So on average, when they aggregate to the country level, we would find no relationship. And finally, we could also talk about here about the measurement issues here it is in general would be more difficult to isolate the effects of religion on from the country level factors also for example from institutions when we talk about the relationship at the country level uh, finally we talk about the uh, global and regional perspective and here we documented uh, uh, there are quite some many studies actually published on the topic uh, in various regions, uh, we counted over three, three and a half thousand articles published on the topic. Uh, to give you a comparison, this is uh, would be less than uh, say topic ab about the institutions and happiness or education and happiness, but would be more than, than happiness and migration, for example. Uh, the left figure here showed, shows the total number of articles published on the topic uh, in each region. And you see that uh, if you talk about the totals, this is mostly focused on the Americas and the Europe. Uh, while if we standardize this measure and talk about the number of articles per number of countries in a certain region, uh, then the, these, uh, these studies are basically dominated by the North American and Central American studies. Uh, further, we also talk about the empirical challenges in the uh, in this work. Some of them are also mentioned by the, the the previous speakers. And the biggest challenge here is, of course, the indigeneity, because unhappiness can also drive religiosity. Let's say if uh, there is some uh, adverse times, like one is becoming unhealthy, uh, they, they could also turn to being religious uh, to sort of derive some happiness out of that. So, and the, there could be also some self-selection issues. So based on certain characteristics, the individuals may tend to be more or less religious and else in turn may be less or more happy. And finally, it's quite difficult uh, when talking about the relationship between religion and happiness, it's quite difficult to talk about the, uh, the distinguishing religion and culture. So there could be also some omitted variables. Uh, so far, there are not so many uh, solutions to this. Uh, for example, there were work distinguishing the effects of uh, religious via policy changes, like opening casinos in, the, in certain parts. Uh, historical instruments have also been used. For example, in my previous work, I was uh, uh, looking into the using as an instrument the share of religious people some uh, in a very distant history in post-communist countries. And finally, there is also work that looks into the exogenous variation in the, in the timing of Ramadan. In terms of future agenda, uh, more focus should be given to the channels. And uh, that would include both individual level channels and also political institutional environment. In terms of explaining why would uh, religion affect happiness and the, uh, how exactly this is happening. Uh, more methodological advancement was also done 
severe field experiments, vignette studies, or also incorporating more psychological and behavioral questions in surveys. And uh, uh, also important point would be to talk about the role of religion and economic policies that are shaping uh, well-being and sustainable thought. And this is basically it about uh, our chapter. The chapter is also available via this link. And if you have any questions or comments, I would be happy to hear them. I have a question, Olga. I was I was wondering. Um, so I guess when you presented, um, you know, the possible channels, it was all about how great religion is, how it makes you happy. But I mean, um, is there work that shows that maybe it also has a dark side, like maybe leading to pe for to people being, I don't know, more less accepting of others, you know, ostracizing others, and you know, more conflict. Um, I guess at the country level, maybe that's why we see. One reason why we see, you know, no correlation is because there's like all these opposing um, channels. I don't know. But what about at the individual level? Do you know if there's like, if there are any studies that show that religion also might have a dark side? Yeah, in, in, in economics, I'm not aware of such studies. The, the most economic studies uh, would show either positive relationship or non-significant relationship, but also sort of with the positive sign. In psychology, there are actually studies that show that uh, the, the religion may have the dark side and may bring also unhappiness. So, uh, sort of, there are some negative emotions, for example, if uh, there is some certain adverse event happening, uh, the uh, religious person who would who have followed these rules and basically was truly the religious person uh, sort of could, could potentially blame religion for. Why, why this would happen to me, why this, uh, this, is, uh, this adversity, why I'm surviving this adversity. And this would, could potentially bring also unhappiness, I think. But as I mentioned, in, in economics, there are actually no such studies that would talk about the negative aspect. And I would now suggest to proceed to the next presentation because we are, we are running shortly a bit of time. And the next presentation is by Aurelian Lopiano on religion and risky habits. Thank you very much, Olga, for your brief presentation. Uh, my article is called Religion and Risky Habits. And this chapter was submitted uh, to the Handbook of Labor, Human Resources and Population Economics, edited by Professor Klaus Zierman. Um, one minute, just one second to um, share my presentation. Um, okay. Yes. Do you see something? Now, just your desktop. A moment ago, there were slides there. Uh, so, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, now we can see only your desktop. Uh, ah, and, uh, ah, okay. Uh, a moment ago, there were slides there. Okay, I will uh, try to do this. Yes. Okay, I will try again. This one. Yes, now now it's okay. It's okay. With oh. a little bit of snow effect. Ah, <laughs> sorry, I don't know why. Okay. Okay. Could I start? Maybe you could also put it into full screen by pressing Control L. Uh, I'm a little bit old. I'm. Uh... Yes, this one. Yes, perfectly. it's okay. Thank yes, you. okay. Thank you. Okay. You'll see more information on the on the desktop on this presentation, but 
because uh, I will have less than 15 minutes, I will try to be as brief as possible. That's why it's sometimes I will uh, skip some uh, some articles or uh, authors. So um, the concept of religiosity, of course, is is multifaceted and extremely complex, as you will further will see. Um, religiosity relates to a person's beliefs and behaviors or practices associated with a specific religion, tradition, or denomination. Uh, religious behaviors may include support of a faith community, affirmation of in a worship, encouragement of spiritual companions, consolation from prayer, and communication with God through these religious practices. Um, religiosity is associated with uh, attending an organized religion or faith, being closely related to the importance a person places on these religious beliefs and practices. Uh, what is evident from previous research is that religion and religiosity have significant effects on human choices and behaviors, influencing individuals' morality and ethics. Reli religiosity plays a significant role in strengthening the resilience of individuals when faced with difficulties and distress by inculcating meaning into their lives, uplifting and improving, improving their outlook for the future, and ultimately increasing the quality of life. The first slide is about religiosity and its effect on depression, anxiety, and stress. And here uh, I found dozens of articles, maybe even more, um, uh, emphasizing the protective role religion has against various mental illnesses. Uh, mental, mental illnesses ranging from uh, anxiety, depression, stress, and others. Um, investigating the role of religious beliefs among college students in fighting or combating various mental illnesses, Jensen and uh, co-authors found that religiosity, rather than religious affiliation to a particular denomination, has a protective role against different mental, mental illnesses. Uh, Kirchner and Patino found the, a negative association between high levels of religiosity and low levels of depression symptoms, but only in the case of women, while stress was observed to be significant for both genders. Uh, Pokorsky and Varjeva demonstrated no significant effect of religiosity on dysphoric distress, depressive symptoms, or coping with stress. In Asia, in Korea, South Korea, uh, Young and others um, found that religiosity was differently associated with various mental illnesses and quality of life. Um, Lerman in 2018, for a sample of 16 a thousand Hispanic and Latino adults from United States found a positive and direct association between lack of religious affiliation and lack of belief that religion is not at all important in people's life and depressive symptoms. Um, Rose and others exploited a perspective based on the relevant mediational effect of hope the results concluded that uh, for adolescents, only through the indirect role of hope, there is a significant association between religiosity and depressive symptomatologies. Perez and Dahl stress two key aspects of religiosity, namely meaning and peace. Uh, and uh, there is a positive relationship with mental health well-being and quality of life. The same authors underlined that religious people compared to non-religious ones are more likely to have more meaning and peace in their lives. Therefore, based on their findings, it appears that religiosity has a buffering capacity on stress. Um, 
and uh, uh, two more uh, articles. Religious uh, individuals are able to cope with mental illnesses and other psychological problems, uh, increasing their resilience because uh, it is considered that uh, religion provides significance and meaning. And finally, two uh, recent articles by Zecher and Rudolf and Arslan, uh, they documented the positive effect of religiosity on, on hope for the future, therefore uh, emphasizing the reduction effect on depressive symptoms. Okay, the second, uh, the second uh, part of the presentation is about religiosity and its effect on uh, HIV-related risky habits. And here, uh, uh, much of the <clears throat> studies underlined that religiosity is considered a very powerful predictor of um, women's involvement in risky HIV-related habits. Um, being more prone to be at risk than uh, least religious women. Uh, Hardy and Raffaelli in 2003 theorized that sexual risk is related to lower levels of religiosity. Uh, Hasnain and others explored the relationship between religiosity and HIV risk behaviors and HIV serostatus they found interesting results. <clears throat> Contrary to mainstream research, those highly religious were more likely to engage in risky habits associated with injection, paraphernalia, and other equipment. Um, another investigation by Avance and others highlighted that Buddhist type religiosity, along with cognitive behavioral techniques, have a significant impact on reducing drug use and several other HIV risk traits. Uh, religiosity was found to be a protective factor for sexual behaviors among uh, South African men, thus manifesting itself as a potential barrier to HIV transmission in communities. Uh, Ludema, in 2015 proved that high organizational religiosity, non-organizational religiosity and spirituality were related to less risky sexual behaviors involving HIV acquisition. Recently, Boyd Stark and others, uh, analyzing a sample of African-American college students, um, found that only certain aspects of religiosity and spirituality are highly responsible for such risky behaviors. The variable most used in other studies to assess the multidimensional construct of religiosity, namely church attendance or church affiliation, is less important than other uh, uh, dimensions on this topic. Finally, other studies have documented that neighborhood social cohesion and religious participation are important in understanding HIV prevalence associated with risky sexual behaviors and effective prevention. Um, sorry. The effect of religiosity on risky sexual behaviors in general, previous analyses regarding adolescents and youth people have exhibited a negative association between religiosity and age of sexual debut, frequency of sexual traits, and other risky sexual behaviors. The same relationship has been documented also in relationship with external manifestation of religiosity, namely church attendance. In 1998, Paulson and others highlighted that compared to less religious women, highly religious women were less likely to engage in risky sexual behaviors and alcohol consumption. Uh, Rostowski in 2004 highlighted the important role of religiosity 
in reducing risky sexual behavior by delaying the early age for sexual debut in the case of uh, adolescent uh, females, while for boys, the results were mixed. An opposing <clears throat> uh, research findings um, found that uh, religious church-based African-Americans were less, um, were highly, sorry, associated with risky sexual behaviors. An empirical study by Smith in 2015, investigating the risky sexual behaviors among young Latino adults from the United States, found that intrinsic religiosity and acculturation manifest a protective role, while extrinsic religiosity is responsible for the increased risk associated with such uh, sexual behaviors. Rigo and uh, Saroglu in 2018, using Catholic and Muslim samples, demonstrated that higher levels of religiosity were associated with sexual guilt, disgust, inhibition, a desire to achieve and maintain purity, and a lower likelihood of sexual fantasies. Um, and another one, a recent paper by Shalachowski and Tushinska Bokuka, they are Polish, I think, highlighted a new measure for religiosity, namely uh, centrality for religiosity scale, which was conducted and uh, founded by Professor Stefan Huber from uh, University of Bern. He is German, but uh, uh, he teaches in Bern. Um, and this, uh, this um, uh, way of uh, measuring religiosity was uh, uh, used by these uh, authors. Uh, the results showed that only one component of this uh, uh, religiosity scale, namely prayer, reduced the incidence of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, while religious experience increased them. Um, okay. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Newman and others demonstrated that highly religious persons were more likely to get involved in certain health promoting habits, but showed less predisposition for others compared to low religious individuals. Religiosity and its effect on substance use or drug abuse. In general, many studies have pointed out that religiosity is negatively associated with delinquent behavior or deviance, such as drug use. Most of the, of the uh, literature re review I have uh, consulted demonstrated this, this association. Uh, very, very brief, Amy and, and others found that religiosity played a deterrent role in reducing on, or mitigating drug use particularly among white Americans than among black Americans. Um, Corwin and Benda reported different results in that personal religiosity showed only an, an inhibitory effect on hard drug consumption, while church attendance played no negative influence on such substance use. Um, Sinha and others revealed that the importance of religion and church attendance proved to be significant negative predictors of marijuana use. Hodge and others, uh, a research conducted among Latino youth in the southwestern, uh, southwestern United States, uh, emphasized that they are like, less likely to engage in substance use at some point in the future if they have been integrated into religious networks and have shown strong beliefs in religious uh, values earlier in their lives. Uh, in the case of uh, a couple of thousands young Swiss men, Kamel and others underlined the positive effect of religiosity in combating illicit drug use, which was stronger 
than the type of religious denomination used as uh, uh, independent variable. Uh, and finally, an empirical research conducted by Grant and others in 2022, this year, provided evidence uh, among uh, university students that both organizational religious activities and intrinsic religiosity manifest strong effects that cause fewer problems related to drug or alcohol problems. And the last, the last uh, 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 sub chapter is about religiosity and heavy alcohol consumption. Excessive alcohol consumption is uh, uh, another serious issue for public health and well and uh, well being. Yes, several articles provided uh, empirical evidence for one uh, uh, for one relationship or another. Uh, a study by Kovac and others in 2011 partially confirmed the mainstream hypothesis that religiosity protects against the use of various substances, including alcohol uh, consumption. They found that religious denomination is not significant at all, while only religiosity and religious attendance really matter. Um, Kriczynski and Ward in 2012 conducted a large survey among US adolescents and their findings provided empirical support for the view that their religiosity, along with non-permissive parental norms regarding alcohol consumption, close friends and peers, significantly mitigates heavy alcohol use. A more in-depth analysis by Israelovitz and Resnik in 2015 showed that religious upbringing and religiosity manifest a positive effect in mitigating binge drinking, school underachievement, and other illicit behaviors. In contrast, another article did not highlight any significant link between religiosity and alcohol use, but instead marked a significant relationship with filial piety, which in turn appeared to play a protective role against binge drinking or alcohol consumption among adolescents in Tron and others in 2019. Baltazar and others in 2020, 2020 um, uh, conducted a research among a sample of Christian college students and pointed out that those who have internalized the credence, the belief that God wants them to take care of their bodies are much less prone to engage in heavy uh, heavy drinking. And finally, um, um, oh, sorry, I have one more slide. Uh, do I have uh, two more yeah, minutes? Maybe, maybe just half a minute. <laughs> okay, very, very short about religiosity and smoking. Of course, mainstream uh, literature uh, considers that between religiosity and smoking there is, of course, a negative relationship. But in my presentation, I also find, uh, I've, I also found um, research that uh, put into question this, this mainstream uh, uh, analysis. But I want uh, to show you only three relevant papers, in my opinion. One is based on a US national study of youth and religion. An, uh, an article from 2019 by Ni and Yang. Uh, they found that the overall religious context matters for understanding smoking levels among adolescents and young adults. Therefore, <clears throat> findings reveal that a higher proportion of conservative or mainline Protestant population is responsible for a higher likelihood of smoking among among these individuals. Nunziata and Tofoluti in 2019, using data from the German socioeconomic panel for 1998-2006, found that atheists and those unaffiliated uh, with any religious uh, denomination are significantly much more predisposed to smoke compared to religious 
people. And the last one, a paper by Roman and others, 2022, conducted in Romania, uh, underlined that particularly external religiosity reduces smoking habits, while internal religiosity has no significant effect. In conclusion, in conclusion, um, it is obvious that most studies uh, highlight the positive relation between religion and mitigating and reducing several uh, uh, risky and bad uh, and unhealthy habits. Uh, but also there are some uh, evidence to put into in, in challenge this, uh, these mainstream ideas. What is very, very important is the fact that usually religiosity is measured through several um, um, dimensions, intrinsic religiosity, external religiosity, frequency of prayer, church attendance. But it seems that uh, religiosity is much more than this and should be uh, measured in a, in a more in-depth way. Uh, the centrality of religiosity scale is such a, a, an attempt to understand religiosity in a much, much in-depth way. It's not enough just, just to understand religiosity, how many times do you pray uh, per day or how many times per week do you go to church to say that a person is really uh, spiritual or religious. Uh, therefore. Um, most people uh, studies, sorry, converge on the thesis that there is a significant inverse re, uh, association between religiosity and uh, risky behaviors. And further interdisciplinary research is needed to capture even more clearly the mechanism underlying this relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for this attention. very nice. And sorry for. Uh, do we have questions? Yes. Do you know, can I ask one? Yeah, yeah please. Yes, sorry, please. You, you spoke about uh, health and behavior, risky health behavior. Do you know about not, he not related, health related health, uh, behaviors such as uh, religion and um, um, informality in uh, in work or something like that. Do you know about uh, something about that? Uh, unfortunately, I do not have any any uh, ideas. Um, I'm an economist. Uh, I'm an economist, uh, and I didn't uh, um, make any investigation on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. We are running slightly different time, so I would suggest we go to our last presenter, the last but certainly not the least, uh, Boris Gershman on witchcraft beliefs, social relations, and development. So, Aurelian, if you could please stop sharing your screen. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me and accommodating my late appearance. Um, as uh, our section on religion shows, uh, the economics of religion by now is a large, well-established field of study, but I would like to argue that its scope so far has still been uh, quite limited. And so if you look at the empirical uh, work in this field, it has largely covered uh, three main categories of topics, I would say. Um, major world religions and denominations, basic religious beliefs, and religiosity. Uh, on the other hand, other beliefs in the supernatural uh, have received less attention, and this includes hundreds of smaller scale traditional religions that exist around the world, as well as various beliefs that uh, often 
predate and really coexist with big and small religions. Um, and so I was pleasantly surprised uh, when I received uh, an invite from Olga to contribute a chapter on witchcraft beliefs uh, to a section on religion. Uh, by witchcraft beliefs, I mean uh, what you probably have in mind, um, which is the ability, uh, beliefs in the ability of uh, some people to cause harm supernaturally, such as through uh, casting curses or spells. And of course, uh, these beliefs have been uh, widely documented over time and across space. Uh, they share certain commonalities that I describe in the chapter. Uh, over the past century or so, uh, there has been extensive ethnographic research, which uh, comes in uh, the form preferred by anthropologists, which is uh, in-depth case studies uh, with a very narrow local focus. Um, but also recently there has been a nascent but growing quantitative literature on the subject, and uh, this is my focus in the chapter. So how do we measure witchcraft beliefs to do quantitative research on them? Uh, largely, when we talk about contemporary witchcraft beliefs, these measures have relied <laughs> on survey questions, and um, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, in addition to that, uh, there is some scarce ethnographic uh, compendium on historical witchcraft beliefs around the world. Uh, scholars that study uh, witch trials have the luxury of having a bit of harder data from archival uh, work. And obviously experimentalists use all sorts of approaches from surveys of participants to techniques like priming that are standard in experimental work. So in my own research, I have relied mostly on surveys conducted by the Pew Research Center uh, because, well, these are some of the few surveys that contained uh, witchcraft related questions uh, that can be used. So what are those questions? Uh, here are three examples. Do you believe in witchcraft? Yes or no? Uh, do you believe that magic, sorcery or witchcraft can influence people's lives? Uh, and finally, do you believe in the evil eye or that certain people uh, can cast curses or spells that cause bad things to happen to someone? So this last question is particularly important, um, not just because uh, the second part of it, the clarifying part of it captures exactly the notion of witchcraft as defined earlier, but also because this is really uh, the only question contained uh, in all the Pew surveys. So using this question um, allows us to construct the largest possible uh, data set on witchcraft beliefs that is based on consistent definition of what witchcraft is. Um, and so that's what I do in um, my most recent paper that is still um, in the review process, so fingers crossed. So I use that third question on witchcraft to compile a global uh, data set um, covering 95 countries and territories and uh, at the individual level, more than 140,000 individuals overall uh, representative of uh, roughly half of the global adult population. And so I start my chapter by describing some basic patterns from this global data set. So if you look at the map, this is uh, what it looks like. At the country level, you see that there is uh, tons of variation, um, not surprisingly perhaps, uh, from under 10% of uh, self-proclaimed witchcraft believers in places like Northern Europe uh, to about 90% uh, in countries like Tanzania and Tunisia. Uh, but uh, most important takeaway from uh, this map is that witchcraft beliefs are certainly not extinct and are very much uh, widespread, at least uh, based on this survey question. Uh, next, in showing basic patterns, I actually make use of this individual level data set uh, mentioned before uh, to look at some uh, simple sociodemographic correlates of witchcraft beliefs. And so I'll show you a selection of those. Um, so these are also not going to be surprising. So we see that uh, people with higher levels of education and those with a better uh, self-reported economic situation are less likely to believe in witchcraft. Uh, younger people are somewhat more likely to believe in witchcraft. Um, but looking at these three bar charts, I would say again that for me, the main takeaway is that uh, witchcraft beliefs basically cut across socio-demographic groups. And so even 
uh, within the group of those having above secondary education or those with a very good self-reported economic situation, uh, close to 40% of them claim to believe in witchcraft, which I think is a lot. Uh, looking at religion more specifically, the key pattern here is that uh, witchcraft beliefs and religious beliefs go hand in hand. That is, for example, people who uh, claim that religion is important or very important in their life are also the ones that are most likely to believe in witchcraft. And same uh, for those who believe in God um, and are religiously affiliated versus unaffiliated. Uh, the first uh, bar chart here on the left um, creates a somewhat false impression that uh, witchcraft beliefs are more prevalent among Muslims relative to Christians. But if you run a proper regression uh, controlling for individual characteristics and country fixed effects, uh, that actually goes away. So other things equal, uh, there is actually no statistically significant difference between uh, the likelihood of believing in witchcraft between um, Muslims and Christians. Uh, who live in the same country. Okay, so uh, next I move on to the issues, right? Namely to the factors that potentially are the consequences of witchcraft beliefs and potential determinants of those. And so in order to organize the thinking, I uh, suggest what I like to think of as a minimalistic conceptual framework for understanding witchcraft beliefs and minimalistic in the sense that it only relies on the essence of this phenomenon as captured in the definition. So I don't want to assume really anything else on top of that. Um, and so if you just look at the uh, definition of witchcraft beliefs and at the vast ethnographic evidence, then uh, you will see that uh, these beliefs create two types of fear, which are the fear of bewitchment, or right? basically the fear of encountering a witch, uh, and the fear of being accused of being one. Right, so the fear of witchcraft accusations, which may be particularly severe because a witchcraft accusation may entail severe punishment all the way up to ostracism and uh, killing. Um, and so these witchcraft related fears may be viewed basically as fears of sanctions for norm violation. And these fears affect attitudes and behaviors, which is the key to understanding the social costs and benefits of witchcraft beliefs. So on the benefits side, uh, there is this big idea that essentially uh, if you fear that any deviation from local social norms may trigger uh, an accusation of witchcraft or supernatural punishment through a witchcraft attack, you are less likely to do so. And that means that witchcraft beliefs potentially uh, enhance cultural conformity and force social cohesion. And the related uh, theory here or observation is that witchcraft beliefs are potentially most useful in communities which lack alternative ways of maintaining order such as modern institutions you know trustworthy courts police and a centralized state um, on the cost side there is a much longer list uh, of issues and so these fears of witchcraft have been argued to um, lead to anti-social attitudes and behaviors uh, create anxiety, uh, restrain mobility and innovation. And so the remainder of the chapter is organized uh, by these main issues and uh, reviews the literature, the quantitative literature on each of these things. Um, so I know we have a little time, so um, I, I won't be able to probably cover everything in, in detail. So instead I'm gonna uh, go very quickly over some of these and illustrate the main idea uh, using cross-country scatter plots from uh, that recent paper of mine, just to illustrate uh, the key um, sign of the relationship or la lack thereof. So the topic that um, kind of is particularly dear to me because uh, that's what I explored in my first uh, paper on the subject back in 2016 uh, is this idea that uh, witchcraft-related fears basically erode the social fabric of society or what we like to call social capital. And so in that 2016 paper, I do show that this pattern indeed, indeed is observed uh, at the local level in Sub-Saharan Africa. That is in regions where we have higher prevalence of witchcraft beliefs, we see less trust um, and less uh, charitable giving 
and uh, participation in group activities. At the country level, these scatter plots show that this is also observed. So for example, uh, where we see more witchcraft beliefs, we see less uh, generalized trust, generalized fairness, and less uh, recent experience of charitable giving. So by the way, these scatter plots are always conditional on continental fixed effects, but nothing else. Uh, there is also recent experimental work uh, that uh, is consistent with this notion about the negative relationship between uh, witchcraft beliefs and pro-sociality. And so I uh, will let you read that uh, in the chapter. Um, less attention has been uh, paid to the relationship between witchcraft beliefs and anxiety. So uh, we just uh, uh, heard a presentation of how religiosity alleviates anxiety. So what I find across countries is that uh, witchcraft beliefs appear to do the opposite. That is, in countries with higher prevalence of witchcraft beliefs, you observe lower levels of life satisfaction, uh, lower levels of reported uh, locus of control, or that is control, perceived control over life events. And we also see a positive correlation with uh, zero-sum thinking. Uh, in an ongoing work, I uh, explore this relationship in greater detail at the individual level and find basically consistent results. Uh, next, I mentioned that on the cost side, uh, we often see the lack of mobility and innovation. So this shows up in the data as well. Uh, you see that uh, in countries with more prevalent witchcraft beliefs, uh, there is um, fewer innovative activity as measured by patent applications or share of R&D expenditures in GDP. And there is also um, less of an innovative culture as measured, for example, by expert opinion on the prevalent appetite for entrepreneurial risk. When you look at broader measures of development, the picture is much murkier. In fact, if you just look at linear relationships uh, with things like per capita GDP or years of schooling or HDI, um, you can see in the top row uh, that there isn't much going on after you control for continental fixed effects. However, uh, if you uh, run a quadratic regression, all of a sudden you see a hump-shaped relationship uh, suggesting that um, witchcraft beliefs and, for example, log per capita GDP are um, related according to this inverted U relationship. Um, and so I speculate in the chapter that this is reflective of obviously the multiple channels that relate development and witchcraft, but in particular, the tension between two main um, literatures uh, which are the literature on modernization, which basically says that as economies develop and people get wealthier, healthier, and more educated, uh, witchcraft beliefs should dissipate. Um, and the more recent literature in anthropology uh, on the modernity of witchcraft, which argues that not so fast, that some of these uh, features of development, like introduction of new technology, creation of new disparities, may actually trigger the revival of witchcraft beliefs. So that's very speculative, but I want to point out uh, this hump-shaped relationship. Um, now to the benefits side, uh, I do find a positive relationship between witchcraft beliefs and measures of cultural conformity. For example, uh, witchcraft beliefs are associated with lower individualism and higher collectivism based on Hofstede data set. Uh, they are positively related with the importance placed on tradition uh, from the val World Values Survey, and they're also positively related to measures of in-group uh, bias or conformism, in this case illustrated by uh, lower values of the Migrant Acceptance Index from the Gallup World Poll. Uh, there is also some uh, experimental work uh, supporting uh, the relationship between uh, witchcraft beliefs and uh, forced conformity or sharing. Um, there is a very strong relationship between the quality institu of institutions and witchcraft beliefs. So in countries that have strong institutions, such as the rule of law, protection of property rights, and strong confidence in local police, uh, we see that witchcraft beliefs are much less prevalent. This is robust to controlling for things like income per capita. And this is consistent with this idea that perhaps uh, witchcraft beliefs are useful in societies that uh, lack proper institutions because they help maintain social order. Lastly, I look at um, exposure to misfortunes as a potential explanatory force. 
this has long tradition in anthropology, the idea that exposure to misfortunes um, kind of enhances witchcraft beliefs, uh, similar to how it enhances religiosity. Uh, so here, evidence is mixed at the country level. I do find a positive relationship for two metrics of misfortune, which are exposure to agricultural drought and somewhat surprisingly unemployment rate. In an earlier paper, I explore one particular big time misfortune, which is the slave trade. And I trace the prevalence of witchcraft beliefs in both uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America to historical exposure to slave trade. Um, I should also mention that there is literature on uh, witch trials and weather shocks, uh, which gives uh, kind of uh, mixed evidence as well. So there is literature showing that there is a pattern here and there is literature showing that there is no pattern. Um, okay, to um, wrap things up, some takeaways. Witchcraft beliefs are not gone, they're with us. They cut across socio-demographic groups they go hand in hand with uh, religious beliefs. Um, we now have uh, some robust correlation, correlational evidence on some aspects of witchcraft beliefs. We have some early experimental results. Uh, you can get acquainted with all of this in more detail in my chapter. In general, it's a growing quantitative literature on a fascinating subject, and I hope um, it will continue to grow. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this very nice presentation and uh, do we have questions can well, I yeah. could just quickly ask for the the gender uh, aspect in the whole thing it can be female and can be male uh, which yes. beliefs and of course females and male people can have these beliefs but it can be also about uh, 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 men or or women affiliated with, with, with this kind of belief? Yes, so that's a, that's a very good question. So there is, uh, w whenever I present uh, my work on witchcraft, uh, usually uh, people have this uh, prior that the witch woman, is yes. woman. Yeah, exactly. Woman. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It's exactly. Not. It's not. Exactly. So I have to explain that this is kind of, this is a bias, <laughs> our pre-existing bias. That's not the case. Uh, there are regional differences, of course, but uh, the, both men and women uh, can be accused of witchcraft and are. Um, so I haven't explored this particular question uh, quantitatively. The only thing I can tell you based on the evidence is that if you look at a gender as a correlate of witchcraft beliefs, it's basically the same. So there is no statistically significant difference in saying that females are more likely to believe or, 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 or men are more likely to believe, so it's a wash. Yeah, but I think that it would be very interesting to explore uh, witchcraft beliefs in connection with uh, things like uh, gender disparities, because there is some um, uh, anthropological literature on the subject, particularly in relation to India. Yes, so I write an interesting paper and submit it to the Journal of Population Economics. <laughs> okay. I will consider that. Thank you. Okay. Can I? Can Do we have time for one other one? Yeah, please. I wonder if there's uh, rules to live by uh, uh, among these uh, members, you know, of these uh, society uh, <clears throat> communities. Is there rules to live by? Uh, what do you mean by that? What you can do, what you can't do, something like that. Well, okay. So uh, you're, you're asking whether in communities uh, where belief, beliefs in witchcraft are prevalent, there are some kind of social norms? Right. Well, I think that you know any community has some social norms. And uh, the idea is that I briefly mentioned earlier that uh, witchcraft beliefs may act to enforce some of those norms, right? Because uh, when you see accusations of witchcraft emerge is typically when someone is in violation of some informal rules. So for example, if you decide to go to the city and get education, right? Instead of staying in your local village and stick to what people have been doing for ages, then you know, you are standing out, you are showing off, and then you are more likely to actually both 
uh, attract a type of witchcraft attack or being accused of being a witch because look at you, uh, you are a witch because you are using supernatural powers to you know, get access to fancy education or maybe accumulate some wealth. So in that respect, this is exactly how uh, this enforcement of conformity has been argued to operate through instilling fear. So basically it's like any other religion. Uh, yes and no. And so I think that's kind of fascinating that there are many commonalities and there are also differences. Thank you. Thank you for this actually very nice conclusion of our session. We've just seen that the topic of religion is quite diverse and there are also differences and commonalities within it. Uh, I would like to thank once again all the presenters and also audience for questions and the comments. Stay tuned for more interesting chapter on chapters on religion and other aspects of labor, human resources and exploration. And see you next time. Thank, thank you. you very much. Wish you all the best. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone.